Good morning, everyone. We will get started with today's small business boot camp session in just a moment. We know we have a great crowd with us today, so we want to give time for everyone to log into today's session, and then we will jump into today's content. For those of you just joining, we will get started with today's boot camp session in just a moment. We're excited to have you all joining us today. And I hope I can speak for everyone that we are excited about today's topic. Love seeing those good mornings in the chat. Good morning, good morning, happy Tuesday. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get today's session started. So good morning and welcome back to the Small Business Boot Camp. My name is Faith Ritchie and I'm the Small Business Programs Manager here at the Arizona Commerce Authority, filling in for usual host Robert Theobald. Now, if you are new to the Small Business Boot Camp, we always like to acknowledge, give thanks and acknowledgement to our many community partners who without their time, effort, and expertise, we would not be able to make sessions like these today possible. The Small Business Boot Camp was formally designed to assist small businesses of less than 20 employees return from the COVID crisis stronger than ever. However, we have continued with our programming to help provide content to assist small businesses prepare for success plan for the future, and grow a thriving business. It continues to be a statewide initiative supported by our many community partners and hosts the content library and newly added workshop series of extended topics. The content library is the collection of more than 200 previously recorded webinar sessions covering many different topics, strategies, and tools to assist entrepreneurs and businesses succeed. Additionally, the ACA has other services and resources available to assist the small business community throughout the state. So whether you are looking to start, grow, or scale, there may be additional resources available for you. For information regarding these programs, our small business services, Arizona at Work, and the Arizona Manufacturing Extension Partnership, I encourage you to visit the Arizona Commerce Authority's webpage. Now, speaking of looking to start, operate, and grow, the ACA hosts the Small Business Checklist, which is an interactive online guide to help answer all of those commonly requested licensing and permitting questions for local, state, and federal levels. Special announcement, I know Robert has shared this in previous boot camp sessions, however, our Small Business Digital Academy program applications are still open. The Small Business Digital Academy is a six-week cohort-styled program to help small businesses scale their online presence and build their digital capacity. So if you are a small business owner who's looking to refresh or update or even create your online presence, I encourage you to visit the Small Business Digital Academy website and submit an application if it interests you. 
If you do have any additional questions, you can reach out to me directly. And I know those links and emails are being shared in the chat. So please don't hesitate to reach out with those questions. We are happy to answer those and hope you can participate with us. Now here's a look of ahead for our upcoming boot camp sessions. Now next week we will not be hosting a boot camp session on Tuesday due to the 4th of July holiday. We want to make sure no one's having to rush back to join us on Zoom that Tuesday morning, but we will resume with our normal schedule July 12th with our Yavapai SBDC partners to talk about cutting costs and managing cash flow. And then we'll be joined again to talk about habits for successful growth. So please, I encourage you register for those upcoming sessions. I'm sure we will have a lot of great resources and information shared in those upcoming sessions. Now, the reason we are all here today, we are so excited to welcome a new presenter to the boot camp. Cliff Jones is a third generation entrepreneur, a family man, author, artist, community builder, and strategic business advisor in Arizona since 1986. He provides strategic consulting and lending solutions for commercial real estate development with a passion for rural economic development. Cliff volunteers his time to improve community mental health awareness. He created and self-funded a free public platform for mental health advocacy at the Clarity Channel, Improve Your Mental Health on YouTube, and a support group on Facebook. You can find Cliff's published work on Amazon, business journals, HuffPost, Medium, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So I don't think I need to say anything more, but we are excited for Cliff to join us for this session, revealing a simple and powerful way to strategically improve the odds of success for your business. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn the time over to our presenter, Cliff Jones. Thank you very much, Faith. Let's get right to it. Everybody, it's an honor to be with you today. Uh, and, and I'm going to walk you through a process I've used for many years for my own businesses and one I've used to help hundreds of other businesses. So this is more than anything else, a journey of discovery about who you are, who your business is, the uh, strategy behind strategic planning, and creating action plans that drive results. As Robert Frost once said, the best way out is always through, and Robert Frost happens to be one of my favorite uh, authors, poets, um, and as Faith has already uh, shared with you, I've been a lifelong business owner. Uh, raised my family in Arizona over the last 30 plus years, and I feel blessed to be a resident of Arizona and a small business owner even to this day. I live for small business owners and will always uh, have a passion for writing about coaching and mentoring small business owners, namely because small business ownership is really the lifeblood of all future large businesses. If you don't know this, small businesses that grow provide 60% of the jobs in America. So this blueprint is designed to help motivated, disciplined business owners, executives, the managers, the employees, and the contractors, also stakeholders, investors in the appropriate instances for your business, if that's relevant to you. So how do we define success? Well, the way we typically define sec success is we set a goal and we think about um, how to get there and we make choices along the way. And when we know what we want, for example, when I was a younger man working for other people, I knew I wanted to own a small business. I didn't know what kind of business that would be or how I'd get there, but I knew when my soul was dying working for other people in my late 20s that I needed to find a way. And at that point, I had two small children, a wife who was staying home with them, and the journey into uh, life of an entrepreneur isn't easy, but it can be very rewarding and fulfilling if we're willing to endure some of the hardships we encounter. So, 
what I want to emphasize is the process I'm going to show you, a blueprint. It doesn't have to be fancy. It's a process. It's not an event. You can update these strategic plans as you go. They can be very simplistic, um, and they're generally used for internal purposes. A formal business plan would look much different and would be used in the instances where you need to raise capital from investors or bankers in, in the sense that you need an SBA or USDA loan or private capital. And that's different from the planning process I'm gonna be sharing with you today. But I wanna emphasize this is not a one-time process, it's an ongoing process. So the way clarity works is a strategic blueprinting process is we start by knowing where we are and what we want. I'm gonna show you a quick process for assessing what I call clarity in your business. And as a side note, radical clarity, how to empower your people for better results at work is available on Amazon. It's my newest book and it details everything I'm gonna walk you through very quickly today in the next 40, 45 minutes. The second way this works is it's a process for including your whole team, including contractors, because we learn a lot about each other, how we communicate, how we perceive things, how we add value in our unique roles. And I encourage you all to include your entire team in this process if you choose to follow it and, and put it to work. The other way this process works is it allows you to get crystal clear on your core action steps. When I define radical clarity, it means knowing exactly what not to do, because when you know what not to do, you're free to know what you should be doing to make the most progress in your respective business. Once you know what to do by knowing what not to do, especially if you have experience as an entrepreneur, you're going to have the war wounds, the scrapes, the bruises, and you're going to know pretty much how much those mistakes cost you. And generally speaking, we do our best not to repeat the mistakes of the past. And then again, allows you to implement a plan of action and begin measuring results as you progress in your business. The other thing I encourage is we're always learning on the job. We're always adapting. We can't plan for everything. And you're going to see that in this process, I don't go much further out than three to five years with the vision. And I'm going to uh, show you how the vision, mission, all that works next. Now, so, before Cliff shares his presentation and slides, we do have a quick poll question just to take a gauge of our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. And then Cliff, if you want to go ahead and share your slides. Okay, Faith. And we can jump in. Minimize that. All right, so you can you, no, I got to share my screen again. All right. Okay, so if you've ever read the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber, Michael Gerber talks about working on the business versus in the business. Now, when we first start a business, basically we're going to have multiple jobs and it's very hard to take time away from working in the business to think strategically about the future direction of your business and all the elements that go into it. So what I encourage you to do is block time on a regular basis. Maybe it's monthly. You pull back from working in the business. You bring your key people away and you focus on the results and the processes and the systems that can be improved upon to make con constant and continual progress in your own thinking and decision-making, your communication and the results that affect the business. So let's see, okay. So when we start, what we like to know is where we are now and how clear is everybody involved in your business on where you're going. Most entrepreneurs, we move very quickly. Um, we're self-reliant in a lot of cases. One of the unique challenges we have is learning to delegate and trust other people, especially when it seems harder to find good people. And this is a very quick process that I'll, I'll go through just to help you understand how to assess where you are. So if you have uh, the inclination to invite all of your team members to the process, what you're gonna ask everybody is, how clear are you on the goals and what's expected of you as a contributor, an employee or contractor in your unique abilities toward our goals? How clear are you on what our mission is? I'm gonna describe how we get to a clean mission statement and give you some examples. Mission statement is essentially what it is we do. 
how clear is everybody on the company's vision? Meaning, does everybody know where we want to be in three to five years or perhaps longer if that's your time frame? Does everybody know about the company's unique purpose and the why behind it? A lot of organizations will have a uh, what's called a social impact. If you know the brand Patagonia, their purpose is to really use 1% of their profits to improve the planet. So there's a when there's a big why behind a company, that's typically known as a purpose statement, which is a little different than the mission statement. We talk about core values. If you can identify clearly what your core values are, integrity, trust, um, hard work, whatever those core values are, and you hire people who share those core values as human beings, you're much more likely to have people to uh, practice the core values in all, all aspects of uh, a day in, in the business. It's important to talk about your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and threats. I like to look at threats in a, in a healthy way, meaning what can we learn that could take us out of the game? Now we can't plan for everything, but we, when we can assess what our strengths, our weaknesses and our opportunities are, including the threats, we improve our awareness. We improve the collective awareness of the organization, meaning everybody should have eyes and ears and be thinking, um, on behalf of the organization in terms of what's best for the company as opposed to me as an employee. Uh, when we talk about company brand, that really relates to how you market, communicate your value, how you sell, and how you provide customer service. If you've ever hired a marketing person or a salesperson and they're not asking you, well, what's the vision of the company? What are the goals of the company? What do you define as your core values? Well, they just aren't aware of what goes into the elements that build effective marketing and selling and customer services practices. When we talk about commitments and accountability, what that really maps to is core values. If we say we're going to do something, we want people who commit to that. We want people who understand what their role and responsibility is, and we want them to show up every day, work hard, and, and, and do their very best, again, for the benefit of the company and the customers. So that's what we really want to talk about when we're clear on commitments and levels of accountability to the team. When uh, you look at number nine, we're talking about measures of success, often termed, uh, or uh, the phrase you'll hear is key performance indicators. Those are typically financial measures of success, including income statement and balance sheet. And then the 10th one is, um, I trust the people in our business. Leadership, effective leadership is really about uh, walking a walk where people can trust you implicitly. If you've ever worked for somebody that kept changing their mind, changing the direction of the company, changing the services, firing people for reasons that weren't clear uh, or, or for, for whatever it is, we have to instill trust. So when we have a culture of trust and accountability, we tend to align better as a team. When you do an assessment like that, and it doesn't have to be a formal assessment, you can ask people these things one on one, what you want to first do, uh, being aware of those gaps is figure out why the gap exists and communicate very quickly and clearly and how to close those gaps. So once you've assessed where you are, I suggest the second step, which is going into a process called discovery. And uh, building an organization, a company, it's really a team sport unless you're a business of one. Now, the, the gentleman who's, who's been our uh, bug guy, we call him the bug guy for the last like 30 plus years. I'm a very loyal guy in many ways. Um, he said to me one time, you know what? I used to have a lot of employees and I got rid of them all because it was just too stressful. And if you didn't know this, the Italians have a curse and the curse goes like this may you have many employees. So even though building an organization and a company is a team sport, it, it, it compels us to become much more aware of how, how we show up as a leader because great leaders can build and hire, can hire great people and they can foster a culture of trust and accountability and they can keep good people. And we see that at higher levels of organizational development. And I suggest that the more diverse your team is, um, including any contractors or trusted advisors you have, that your probability of success is higher. 
When you go through this process, I often suggest that there be a scribe so they're taking notes and, and creating a document that leads ultimately to what we call your action plan or blueprint. Many times in business, we wanna charge forward. Uh, an entrepreneur's nature tends to be inherently impatient. We may not uh, wanna work on the business as much as we probably should or could. And that precludes us from getting input from people that might be very valuable. So for example, um, anybody answering your telephone, that's generally the first line of communication a new or, or existing customer is gonna have with you. If that person answering emails, dealing customers, answering the phone, if they're not completely in tune with where you are as an organization, if they're not happy, if they're not valued, if they're not, uh, if they're not dealing with the stresses in life or business well, that's going to show through to everybody they come in contact with. So that's why I encourage everybody uh, listening now, we have 61 people, which is phenomenal, to be very inclusive when you're doing this process. Everybody is valuable in the company if you see them that way. So here are 16, what I consider crucial top discovery questions. Now, the last business I built and sold was a digital marketing agency. It's one of the most stressful businesses I've ever built because the expectations tied to marketing can be pretty stressful. And that partially explains less hair than I had 10, 20 years ago. But these are the essential questions I needed to know to be a good marketing consultant or trusted advisor. So what I want to know and what you want to know is what's our 12-month goal? What's the problem, challenge, or market need that we're trying to meet? And what, what, are the, what are the solution or unique value that we offer? Because if you don't have something unique, then you're probably dealing in a commodity, and then it's hard to uh, charge a price above what the commodity price is going for in the market. So your, your unique value and solution, very important to understand and communicate when it gets to your marketing and your selling techniques. Number four, who is our ideal or customer? Now we can't serve everybody. So the more focused you are on what we call an avatar or persona of an ideal customer, the more compelling your marketing messaging and sales and customer services practice, practices can be. So if you have more than one, you're gonna to wanna to factor that in. Ideally, you're going to focus on the top three avatars and get very detailed and clear such that you might have on cubicles or on the wall around you an image of your ideal customer. The old saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words and that's true for a reason. Question number five is what is our mission? And that's really what we do. When you see the mission statements I'll walk you through, it describes succinctly what it is you do to provide value. I touched on this before. What is our purpose? Why are we in business? Are we in business to improve the, the work environment of our customers, to provide a consumer good or service? And, and, uh, and you really want to dig deep into that because again, it will help in your branding, marketing, sales, and customer service practices. Number seven, what is our vision over the next three to five years? That I feel is a reasonable timeline to talk about vision. And I'm going to give you an example of a vision statement. Number eight, core values. Very important because when you define your core values, it helps with your hiring practices. And when your hiring practices are disciplined, I've done a lot of recruiting over the years. I'm going to tell you this, most hiring practices are subconsciously, what's happening consciously and subconsciously is, do we like this person? And you've all been in an interview situation when you're applying for a job. And what happens is when the interviewer likes the person, they start selling the job. And today, people, business owners, tend to be quite desperate to find great people. And what we're doing is, is short-circuiting our hiring processes. And all that does is affect retention on the back end. So when you define your core values, it helps in many ways, including hiring and retention. Number nine, I touched on, you need to talk openly about your strengths, your weaknesses, the opportunities, and threats. Eleven, who are our key people and what are their roles? Is, I've seen this especially in the marketing uh, silo. Uh, marketing hiring practices can be as abysmal as any other, but what we expect from marketing people is generally unrealistic. And what I mean by that is if you hire a marketing manager, that doesn't mean that person's great at building websites and writing copy and designing things and 
yet we hire marketing people and we expect them to do a hundred different things, which tend to be very unique skill sets that get combined in a typical larger marketing department. So when you define your key people, you wanna be very specific on what their roles and responsibilities are because that leads to holding them accountable and they can agree to be accountable to you. Number 11, this is really defining the personality, vibe, or essence of your brand. Now, if you've ever worked with a big uh, ad agency or marketing agency, you, you're familiar with a more formal branding process, which can cost thousands of dollars. Typically, small businesses don't have or need to commit that capital to a formal branding process, which is why I include a, a simple branding process, which you'll see for small businesses to practice and develop. Number 12, what are the best ways for us to go to market? And what that really means is how are we going to market effectively? Are we going to advertise? Are we going to use social media? Are we going to use direct selling? When you choose the right way to go to market for your business, you're much more efficient with your capital, you're measuring results, and you tend to feel a lot better about the money you're investing in marketing, sales, and customer service. 13, what is our sales and customer service process? We've all experienced what it's like to be a customer and receive lousy service. So clearly we wanna do our best to define processes that empower our salespeople and customer service people to do their very best when they're working. 14, what are our key systems, tools, and processes? Over the years, I'd say 20 years ago when I sold my wealth management and financial planning business, I went into sales coaching, training, and that evolved into digital marketing. And at that time, the internet was just being big. Almost everybody needed a website, wanted a website. And you remember, hopefully you remember when that was. Well, since then, a lot of these tools have evolved online and they're very affordable compared to um, big companies that could only uh, basically afford these enterprise systems. So the advantage is, we can easily afford, for example, many services are free. Social media, Facebook accounts, Twitter, things like that. They're free to us unless we use them at a higher level. But using them in an appropriate way is a discipline that lends itself to higher probability of success in your business. So you want to really talk about the systems, tools, and processes that are the most compelling and advantageous for your business. 15, what are our key operational processes we need to improve and why? And that's basically about talking openly and honestly what we learn on the job. Because if everybody's uh, accountable and they're clear on their role and responsibilities and we make mistakes because we all do, nobody needs to be um, uh, you know, blamed or shamed for doing uh, making a mistake. But we can look at how the mistake was made. And as a team, we can look holistically at creating support systems, processes, whatever it takes to uh, empower people to make fewer mistakes. 16, again, measuring results. In the end, this is going to boil down to your financial statements, including your income statement and balance sheet. So step three is we begin drafting a strategic plan. Now, the context is scheduling time. Generally, I like three hours minimum if I'm going to facilitate a process like this. When I facilitate a strategic planning process, I, I know this process inside and out. I've debriefed the stakeholders, the owners, the leaders, the managers, and encourage them to invite everybody that makes sense in the organization to participate this, in this. Because as we know, a goal without a plan is simply a wish. And that's why it's very powerful to put an internal strategic blueprint in place and include everybody. So you're going to see the pattern here. When we did the clarity for business assessment, I talked about basically 10 questions for discovery. Well, now we're going to dig into actually writing these out and formalizing these. And so going to begin with your 12-month goal. If you're generally a 12-month goal, I hear is we want to improve sales by 20%, 10%. And in order to do that, we're going to set other goals relative to key departments and people who are performing the work. Number two, we're going to define the problem or the need. So there are a couple of ways to, to, to look at this. 
when you are part of the solution and you understand the problem your customers have, you can, you can convey the value that you, you offer them in your marketing by saying, hey, we understand the problem you're facing and here's the solution that we've, uh, we've developed. And it's helped this number of customers and here's what these customers have to say about it. Um, and that's what we call testimonials or social proof. The other way to look at this is more from a, a needs analysis standpoint, and that kind of emanates from the old strategic selling disciplines we learned in the 80s. And um, Neil Rackham wrote a book called Spin Selling, one of the greatest sales books ever written. And what he talks about is let's understand the situation, let's understand the problem, let's understand the implication, and let's understand the needs of the customer. 100% of your marketing should be focused on your customer needs and problems. And what you're going to see in most websites and marketing communications are organizations and people talking about themselves. Nobody really cares about you, what you are, where you've been, what you're doing, until they know that you understand what their problem or need is and that you have a way to meet it. So if you work in a restaurant, you're basically dealing with the problem of, hey, people are hungry. We have 10,000 choices of restaurants to, to eat in and why your restaurant? Okay, so if, if, if you're in the, it, that just gives you an example of meeting a need. The solution is providing a great meal and experience. So when you provide a solution to your customers and the customer experience is a positive one, they're less likely to leave negative social proof. We call those negative reviews. Those can be very painful. And, and in many cases, they're not fair. But nonetheless, we need to deal with that. And we need to set the stage to provide customers with a solution and an experience that wows them such that they're most likely to leave a positive review and certainly not compelled to leave a negative review. And it's all about adding value when you take a solutions-based approach. Talked about this before, defining your ideal customer is really important. If you just start with one, your best customer, the customer that tends to, to um, create the least turbulence or problems for your, you and your employees. They're happy to pay your price. Uh, anytime somebody comes to our house to work, I offer them water um, and I basically love them and respect them and honor them and thank them and I take care of them. And what that does in lifting them up is it, it lifts up their attitude and they're more likely to do a better job for me. So turn that around. When you're defining your ideal customer and, and the value you provide and, and you're, you're focused on providing an amazing experience, it tends to foster goodwill. Again, if you have more than one customer, the process is knowing who they are, where they are, what the psychographics are, what the demographics are. And when, when I facilitate these conversations for teams, we go into more detail, and obviously I'd like to do uh, more of that now, but um, we, we won't be able to in the interest of time. Mission statement. So if you've discussed about the business you're in, it might seem obvious, but that doesn't mean everybody knows what business you're in, especially if you're hiring new talent. Yesterday I was at a bicycle shop. They need a new bicycle fitter. The number one criteria for hiring the bicycle fitter is they never done any bicycle fitting before. And the reason for that is they don't want new bicycle fitters bringing anything they've done before in to contaminate the process in which they train their bicycle fitters. These are world-class bicycle fitters that fit the, the top champions in the world among other cyclists who want a great fit on a bicycle. So basically the mission statement is we're in the business of helping people get strategic clarity. So it's defining what you do. If you're in a networking event, somebody asks you what you do, I'll say something like, well, have you ever met a business owner that wanted to grow their sales by 20% but didn't have a plan? And then what that does is it, it elicits an image in that person's mind. They're like, oh yeah, I know all sorts of business planners who want to grow their business owners who want to grow their sales, but they don't have a strategic plan and they're kind of fumbling around learning on, on the job. So here's some examples of mission statements. Clarity empowers your people to succeed. LinkedIn, to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. PayPal, to build the web's most convenient, secure, cost-effective payment solution. Sony, to be a company that inspires and fulfills your curiosity. You want the mission statement, like the vision statement, to be short, 
and memorable so that people can remember the business you're in. Purpose statement. Sometimes they're going to be combined. Not every organization is going to have a purpose statement, but when you do, it's really defining your why. I'm in the business of strategic planning because I love empowering business owners to succeed at higher probability. And the reason for that is I love America. And I know that the more successful businesses have, the more people are going to have jobs. And the more people have jobs, the more we can hire, pay for little league uniforms and braces and all the things we, we need to buy when we're raising families and creating future citizens of our community. So your purpose invites people to understand your motivation and perhaps a cause, and it, and it elicits a feeling of goodwill when it's done well, and people want to do business with you. So here are some purpose words. Um, we won't have time to really dive into this. Again, when I'm facilitating it, we're going to spend time on defining purpose words because we're going to write a purpose statement. By the end of the three hours, we want a first draft of your strategic blueprint that's fairly clean and succinct. Vision statement, and this is a short phrase and, and, um, and it's really describing where you wanna be, the impact you wanna have that inspires people in your organization and others, investors, stakeholders, suppliers to wanna do business with you. So here are some examples. Nike, bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body, you are an athlete. Now, Ikea, our vision is to create a better everyday life for many people. And it's fair to say anybody who's done business with Ikea has a great customer experience. And that's why their brand is so well recognized and the company tends to be very profitable year after year. When it gets to Amazon, uh, our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. And certainly we can see the results Amazon's uh, getting in terms of the good, the bad, the ugly that goes with that. Core values, this really leads to commitments. If you're gonna say you value trust, integrity, hard work, you need to do that. All of us have worked for managers or leaders or bosses, they'd say one thing and do another. And that does nothing but undermine trust and confidence in being a worker in that workplace. The last thing we wanna be is an owner or a leader who says one thing and does another. So the key to, to working with people is sharing those, core, sharing those core values, talking about them openly, and then hiring to those core values. Because if people share your core values as an organization, chances are they're gonna be better long-term employees. SWOT analysis, mentioned this earlier, it's really about creating a heightened awareness and what fosters better results. When you work on the business, you can talk about the mistakes. Those are weaknesses. You can talk about the opportunities for improving upon those weaknesses. If those weaknesses um, continue to be issues, well, then you have a threat on your hand. So for example, turnover today is an issue. Hiring good people is the number one thing I hear that's most challenging for the people I'm coaching and teaching. So given that, that's a threat. If you can't hire good people, then you can only handle so much business. And if you're handling too much business, it creates an inordinate amount of stress for the people working for you. And stress, if you don't know this, I do a lot of stress coaching. I have a whole workshop on workplace stress. Stress is the number one killer in America. It creates more than 60% of all major diseases when stress goes untreated. It creates three out of four doctor visits and it costs US organizations more than $300 billion a year. So if you have stress in the workplace, which we all do, you wanna mitigate it because untreated stress in the workplace is a massive threat and an opportunity to improve upon it. Your competitive advantage is really your unique value. And if you're in a very competitive business, which we all are, the more clearly we articulate and practice our unique value, deliver upon that promise, and we, as we talk about in branding, chances are people are going to leave you better reviews, talk about um, uh, your, your business to their friends and family, refer people to you, things like that. So you really wanna get clear on unique value and find the words that will come through on your website, email marketing, anything you're using for marketing and communicating your value. Okay, so when you're drafting the strategic blueprint, again, what we're really using this for is to get into action planning. 
what action steps are we going to take that make the most sense so that we're better stewards of the financial resources we have, the time we have in a given day, and we can align and all be more clear on how to do a collective good job for uh, the customers we serve. So I break these down into four pillars. Pillars of profit. These are the things that drive profit. I put human capital number one because people drive results. Even if you're a business of one, you're only as good as you show up every day, day in and day out. If you're clear, if you're energized, if you're excited about your business, it's going to show in all aspects. But we can only go so far alone. At certain point, we need to scale and learn to delegate. The number one way small businesses do that is we hire independent contractors. The resources for that include Upwork, Fiverr, Craigslist, LinkedIn. There are a lot of ways um, to recruit people today. And, uh, and, and independent contractors, for example, if you hire somebody like me as a director of marketing or a VP of sales and you look at salary.com, small businesses can't afford $300,000 a year, $240,000 a year, which are the typical comp plans for a senior executive with 20, 10, 30 years of experience that can come and work for your business and start implementing systems and processes and tools and driving results very quickly, which is what you would expect when you hire anybody. But you can hire independent contractors for a fraction of the cost. Again, you have a burden of using a disciplined hiring process because if you're winging it, you're going to you're going to hire people who aren't a fit. You're going to have more turnover, and that's going to create a lot of different issues. So you're see seeking people to do the job right the first time, on time, every time. My first boss was an Air Force uh, um, captain, and he said, "Cliff, I want you to do the job right the first time." And I'll never forget that lesson. His name was Robert Foster. It was 1983 when we typed on IBM Selectric typewriters back in the day. Um, now, when it gets to defining people, you can use an organizational chart if you have that. But again, uh, I work with small businesses. We don't all have organizational charts we can whip out. Our teams tend to be lean, and these can be very simple. What is key is that we know who's on the bus, and we know they're in the right seat, and they're accountable because they're clear on their role and responsibilities, and they've committed to them, and we can trust them to show up virtually every day and be excited about their work and do a good job. Pillar number two is your brand. GTM stands for go-to market. This is, gets into the marketing. When I'm hired to do this process, the number one thing is we want better sales. And that's a marketing issue that leads to a selling issue that leads to improving customer service. So we're going to go through the core elements of the brand very quickly. And if you require a more detailed marketing plan beyond what you can do on your own through this blueprinting process, it may make sense to hire a marketing consultant, an agency. And when I had corporate money to spend, I'd hire these big agencies and PR firms. And it was a lot of money. Small business owners, we generally don't have the ability, the luxury to do that. So we end up doing it all on our own. And when it gets to branding, here are the elements of a brand. Again, why are you in business? How do you describe your brand identity or your personality? What are those keywords? Because that's going to affect how you write copy, how your ads communicate value, how they convert or, or don't. How do you describe the voice of your brand? Are you friendly, lively, informal? Or are you more formal, like a law firm or an accounting firm? Which famous people might love your brand and why? How do you describe the benefits of your brand in, from the perspective of your customer? How do you describe the essence of your brand? What if anything works against your brand? So for example, I, I worked with a number of famous people. One of them hired me because if you Googled his name, his brand was devastated online through negative reviews, blog articles, videos, people ranting about how horrendous this guy was. I couldn't be of much value because it would have taken 100 years to fix the broken brand. So that's why when, when you are dealing with anything that's working against your brand, you're going to have to develop a strategy to maintain a great brand image or overcome a tarnished brand, which happens. Uh, and that happens a lot today, even for unfair reasons with negative reviews. 
Number eight, why should your team or clients believe in your brand? If nobody believes in your brand, especially your employees, it's going to undermine trust, which is going to undermine all aspects of performance by people who don't trust you and customers will sense that. Why do your customers or clients do business with you? When we're talking about getting testimonials, what you want to do is you want to ask people, hey, why did you hire us over the other 10,000 companies you could have worked with? And what they're going to do if they trust you and they feel safe telling you this is they're going to tell you why they hired you and you can learn a lot from that. Number 10, what does your brand really stand for? If you have to pick one word, mine is clarity. Clarity lends itself to confidence and execution and driving performance in all the ways I'm talking about through this blueprint. Pillar number three, sales and customer service. Write the core elements of your sales and customer service approach. Define your sales process, the systems and accountabilities and management and coaching. A lot of small business owners are doing their own sales hiring. They're winging it when it comes to, to uh, coming up with reasonable compensation plans. One of the biggest mistakes I see is people uh, who own companies want to hire freelance salespeople, pay them commission only, and wonder why sales turnover is 800% and nobody's getting results. It's especially hired it harder today to hire great salespeople because great salespeople tend to be happy where they are and they're generally not gonna work for, for organizations that don't pay them what they feel they're worth. The best salespeople are worth what they're worth because they think they're worth it. So when you're defining your sales processes, it's gonna begin with hiring practices, um, compensation, reasonable compensation, how you manage people, how you hold salespeople accountable. Sales is a contact sport. Most salespeople are out doing prospecting, networking, and they should be held accountable for their activities. They can't control the dollar volume of sales as much as they can their behavior day in and day out. When I hire a, a remote salesperson or do so on part of a client, I know one of the interview questions is, what's your favorite headset? What's your favorite CRM? If they don't know that, I know they don't wear a headset or use CRM. They're not going to be a fit. If I ask them, how many contacts do you typically make in a day? And they say, in a business-to-business -business context, anything less than 30 or 40 or 50, I'm going to know they're not doing the number of dials it takes to get 30, 40, or 50 people on a phone call. It's very hard to get people on the phone these days because of voice messaging. Pillar number four, operations. So let's just say you nail the marketing, you nail the sales, the customer service is going great, but you can't get packages out the door. Right now, one of the biggest issues is uh, supply chain. We can't get parts, inventory issues. And so we, are, we can get orders, but getting orders out the door is a problem. So case in point, I ordered uh, something for a motorcycle that I have and um, great company by reputation, one of the best, but they were having issues getting orders fulfilled. And instead of communicating that up front to people and staying in touch with customers after the order, they kind of let us fall into the abyss. And in my humble opinion, what I did is I reached out to the owner, which I always do. And I said, hey, what if you let us know from the beginning what your issues are, then we'd be in, in, in alignment with an expectation of, hey, we're not gonna get this order as quickly as we thought, and you keep us up to date so we can know reasonably when we can expect to have the order fulfilled. And those are things that relate to operations, customer service, and there are 10,000 things you can do to improve those things formally and informally. More formal way is to document your procedures, manuals, training solutions. So if you're in uh, businesses, uh, medical practices, addiction recovery, um, um, home health care, things that have lots of uh, compliance and regulatory overlook, you're going to need to invest more in the formal procedure manuals and training solutions to stay compliant. Pillar of profit number five, all boils down to your financial resorts, results. If you're doing all of these things well and your blueprint is, is aligning people with clarity and everybody's in the right seat on the bus and they're showing up and they're excited about their job, it's gonna reflect typically in your financial results. Now, a lot of owners I work with, they're not comfortable about talking about financial results with employees. We call that more open books philosophy. 
So if you're not, that's fine. It's up to you. I am fairly transparent. So anybody who's working with me, um, I tell them everything about the books because a lot of their compensation is going to be tied to the performance of the company based on their unique contribution. But that's not always the case. So it's up to you to uh, talk about the financial results and then look at your strategic blueprint and figure out, okay, where are the opportunities to improve this month or this quarter? Now, if you're in a very sales-driven, marketing-driven business, um, I suggest reviewing this process monthly, meaning you're looking at financial results monthly and, and in the context of working on the business, you're including the key people, the people who are, it's appropriate to include so that you uh, basically uh, can get their input and buy-in and commitment to doing better in the months ahead. So last but not least, uh, what resources do we need? A lot of times we assume as owners Everybody has what they need or they should have what they need because we've given it to them. But what you wanna ask is what's missing, what's not working, uh, and what's most essential to reach your next goal in this department, in your job to achieve the vision for, we, for the company. So once you've got these pieces in place, you're much more uh, free, clearer, to pick action steps, whether it's marketing action steps, hiring action steps, customer service, sales, because what one does is what counts, not when one had the intention of doing. We know what when we intend to do something and don't do it, it happens for a lot of reasons. But when we commit to doing something, we intend to do something, we set goals with clarity and confidence, we have the right people doing it, we empower them to help us build those action steps. So again, when we're working on the business, including everybody, what we're really understanding is, okay, can these people do the job with the tools they're given based on their skill set and their ability to do that job? So planning the action steps, you want to be concise. You don't want to overwhelm people. You don't want to change gears too often because that creates a lot of stress. But planning your action steps doesn't have to be a formal process, but it, it should be a process where there is some documentation. Because in the end, if you create a culture of accountability, you have champions, winners, great leaders, we're accountable. When we say we're going to do something, we do it. If we can't agree to do it, we'll say, hey, I can't be accountable for that. I'm going to need more time. I'm going to need this piece of technology. I'm going to need a different tool. And, and when we listen to them, we uh, empower them to be their best. And that makes all the difference. Um, what, one saying I picked up from an old book is you hire the best, you ditch the rest. And when it comes to hiring practices, one of the worst things we can do is keep people on the team who don't share our values, don't in, uh, foster um, trust in the team. And one of the hardest things to do is to let people go. It's not easy, but trust me, there are many good people out there looking for new jobs. And if you're um, in hiring mode, your mindset needs to be one of confidence and trust that you can put in place the hiring disciplines the strategic disciplines, all the disciplines involved in, in hiring and empowering great people. So in closing, the pillars of profit would be people, your branding and go-to market planning, your sales and customer service, your operations and fulfillment, and of course, bottom line, top line results. Uh, so a few benefits in wrapping up. Your team has generally more confidence when they're included in this process. You're setting goals with clear intention. Everyone shares the same vision. They know where you're going. Your mission is powered by your purpose, core values. Everybody has an opportunity to commit or not commit. That gets alignment. Um, you know your SWOT analysis. You're reviewing it regularly, monthly, quarterly, whatever is right for you. Your brand and your culture is strong, and that affects better marketing. You know specifically who your customers are and who you're not. You can't be all things to all people. And that puts you in a position to meet their needs best of all your competitors. Your solution provides a unique value and an experience that they then tend to tell people about in a positive way. You can command pricing power so you're not dealing with commodity type pricing. 
You measure what counts and you take action with clarity and confidence. And all of these things lead to generally getting better results. So with that, I'm open to questions and uh, answering any questions that uh, we can answer. Excellent, thank you so much, Cliff. Um, as he mentioned, we do have some time available for questions. So if you do have questions, please ask those in the Q&A. Let's see. I from know I went fast, so hopefully that wasn't too fast. I just didn't want to <laughs> no, didn't want to go over. No, I appreciate it. It was such great content. In the Q&A, Evelyn asked, can you recommend a few finished plans to take a look at maybe online? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you just put in, in search uh, strategic plan, plan templates, there are a lot of them available. Um, there are a lot of books on strategic planning, um, traction being one of them. Uh, of course, um, uh, my process evolved to be my process, um, but, but to answer the question, go online and find the one that fits you and your business, and then just emulate it to the best of your ability. Excellent. Peggy asks, does your strategic plan change as the age or maturity of the business? We are heading toward transition planning. Does my strategic plan change? Well, it does in the sense that uh, organizations that cross through a million in revenue and threshold, they tend to, to need more people unless it's a, a lean business like a, an e-commerce business. A lot of virtual businesses can operate through a million with um, fewer employees. But as you grow in revenue, um, you grow in complexity of people. And so in, in the, from the standpoint that you have more people to include in the strategic planning process, yes, that adds a layer of complexity. Because again, um, if you look at people as your number one pillar for profit um, and you value them and you're hiring them well, well, including them in a strategic planning process like them is gonna be very, very rewarding. For, they're, they're generally very uh, grateful to be involved in a strategic planning process. And the larger you get, the more consistent you need to be with your strategic planning. Um, and by the way, Vern Harnish uh, has uh, a process called the one page strategic plan. And that's a very well-known strategic plan promoted by uh, an organization. I think they're still around. I think it's, it's called Gazelles or something like that. But what, when you see that one page strategic uh, plan, it's really two, like uh, that one page generally will evolve into two or three pages depending on how, how much detail you go and how many contributors you have based on the revenue that you're achieving in your business. Excellent, thanks Cliff. We have one more question in the chat from Erica. I have a B2B operation. I manufacture, manufacture soft sewn goods and struggle with getting good processes in place. Any strategies or tips for working on that? Ooh, well, uh, look at your com competition. Um, talk to your competitors, talk to suppliers. You'll, you'll be surprised that, um, you know, maybe it's an e-commerce business, correct? Right, so, so uh, you could be in, in competition with, in theory, everybody online. But if there's a trade association and uh, you have people in that trade association or a network who are successful, um, for example, if somebody approaches me on becoming a business coach or strategic planner, I'm very transparent about my process and my experience. And if they want me to help them, I'll charge them. But um, you'll find that people in your industry are... Um, getting to e-commerce. So not yet. 90 year old company based on direct sales, phone and fax. Yeah. So you're, you're, yeah. F yeah. That's, that's, you're evolving. So talk to competitors, talk to the people you've hired from competitors, especially if they were top performers, um, because they'll bring with them best practices that allow them to be successful in their business. Excellent. Thanks so much, Cliff. And we are coming right on time, perfectly timed. Um, so for those of you, please be sure we will be sharing today's recording and Cliff's presentation on the 
Arizona Commerce Authority's website. I see a lot of great kudos and response. So I think thank we you, know everybody. how we all feel about today's session. So thank you so much, Cliff, for walking us through that process. It was just so insightful and we appreciate your time this morning. I hope all of you return to visit us on July 12th. Remember, we are taking a short break for the July 4th holiday and we continue to share this great content like today's session. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Have a happy and safe July 4th weekend. And we'll see you here on Tuesday, July 14th at 9 a.m. So thanks again, Cliff, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Faith. Take care.